Hello, hello everybody, this is Tiptop MTG here today with another Magic the Gathering video. In today's video, I'm going to be covering the spoilers for Ikoria, Layer of Behemoths, for April 2nd. So, today was the first day of spoilers, and if you guys didn't catch it, I posted like four or five videos today already covering a bunch of different information that was released, whether it's commander, mechanics, you know, anything. There was a ton. I did a trailer review. Uh, trailer reaction i did a lot so uh you guys should check those out there's a lot of interesting stuff and there are some like mechanics that are in these spoilers that were talked about there also i'm not covering the commanders like the commander 2020 that was done in a separate video earlier today Okay, let's move on. Let's go into this. Starting in Wuburg order from common to mythic, we have pacifism. This is a uh, an enchantment aura. It makes it so the enchanted thing can't block. I'm not going to talk too much about it. In the bottom right, you will see the last time it was reprinted, and actually this was reprinted in Corset 2020. Now, this reprint isn't useless because once Corset 2020 rot rotates out, that means that this will stay um, in standard, but it's kind of interesting to see it printed so closely. Then we have a new card, Huntmaster Liger. It's a 4-cost creature cat 3-4 with Mutate, and I'm going to explain what Mutate does uh, just this one time. The rest of the time I'm just going to say Mutate, and then maybe talk about why that's important. But why it's important is so you can pay whatever the Mutate cost is from your hand, and then instead of just playing it like a normal creature, you can either put it under or on top of another non-human creature. So let's say I have a Lana War Elves on the field. Now, what's going to happen is the card that's on the farthest to the top it, that is what constitutes the name of the creature, the type of the creature, the color of the creature, all of that, including the power and toughness. But if you put this, like, un so if you were to put this on top of the Lanawar Elves, what would happen? It, the Lanawar Elves would be renamed to Huntmaster Liger, it would become white, it would have the cat creature type, it would be a 3-4. And it would gain the abilities of the Liger, but it would keep its own abilities. Um, but if you were to put this underneath the Land of War Elves, it would still be a green elf 1-1, one one, except it would just gain this bottom ability. So generally, whatever the bigger creature is, you're going to want to put that on top. Now, that's not always true. If it's legendary, I believe this bypasses the legendary rule. So you could just put it underneath, and boom, since they don't have the same name, you don't have to sacrifice anything. So... Just keep that in mind. So this card says whenever this creature mutates, other creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is the number of times this is mutated. So this honestly doesn't seem like that big of a card in terms of like power and toughness. So this might be something like you throw on the bottom. Like you might have like a 5-5 five five and you just throw this on the bottom and then when this mutates, so that means when this thing gets equipped to it, not equipped, but like attached to it, and whenever anything in the future gets attached to it, it, this ability activates. So that's how that works when we look at the rest of the card. So you can do this to any non-human, not just other things with mutate. So, you know, you want to do it to questing beast. Now questing beast, uh, you can have questing beast stats and all that and combine it with other abilities, which um, I'm kind of concerned to see how this is. And they're going to have to be very careful with like tap and untap abilities. But let's see what other cards we have because there's a lot today. We have a Luminous Bro Brood Moth, which is a 4-cost creature, insect, a mythic 3-4, flying, and it says whenever a creature you control without flying dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a flying counter on it. So this actually, this one card talks about a lot of different things. First off, it's the extended art. You'll find those in the Collector Booster. I did a whole video covering that. Second thing, this has a, what they're calling a, like a, a a Godzilla like style with Mothra Supersonic Queen. Now, how this works Luminous Brood Moth and Mothra Supersonic Queen are the same exact card. You can only have four of them in a deck, so that means you can have two Luminous Brood Moths and two Mothras. You can have four Mothras, but you cannot have four Mothras and four Luminous Brood Moths. So just treat them like they are the same card, just one has like a fancy style on top of it. Second thing I need to talk about is keyword counters. Um, basically, a flying counter, if you put that on a creature, it makes them fly. That's pretty much all you need to know. But what's really cool about this card is that it'll allow all your creatures to basically have a second life. And when they do have that second life, they're going to become more powerful um, because they're going to start flying. So that is a very fun card for white, which is kind of a nice uh, fresh, breath of fresh air. Next, we have Riptide Turtle, which was printed in Theros Beyond Death. This is literally a useless reprint. I'm not going to talk much more about it. Then we have Essence Scatter. This was a two. This is a two-cost um, instant counter-target creature spell. Very um, classic spell. I think it's been in. It's not currently in standard. 
I believe. Uh, yes, because it was last printed in Corset 2019. Actually, it was last printed in Mystery Booster, but the last standard set it was in was in Corset 2019. Um, so it's not an expensive card, but it'll be nice to see it return to the format. That's a joke. I don't want all my creatures to be countered, although there's already that two-cost counter spell, so this one's not going to see any play. Next, we have Polywog Symbiote. It's a two-cost creature frog. Each creature spell you cast costs one less to cast if it has Mutate, which also means if you're not mutating it, it also just costs less. And whenever you cast a creature spell that if it has Mutate, draw a card, then discard a card. I, that's not optional, and you don't actually have to be mutating. You just have to have the creature. The creature just has to have it. This will definitely fit in a deck. It's also a mutatable target. So, uh, yeah, very interesting. You might throw, like, a Hexproofer. Like, if there's, a, if there's a thing with Hexproof, like a mutatable creature with Hexproof, that is going to be so broken that you can just pay something and give anything Hexproof, and it, like, isn't an aura or anything. So that's pretty crazy, if that if that's a thing. I don't know. Next, we have Gloom Pangaloon. This is a 3-cost 1-5. Nightmare Pangaloon. Woo. We have Grim Dancer, which I actually really love this card. It's a 3-cost uh, three, three, and also has double black for black devotion. Creature nightmare, and it says when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose basically two of these: menace, death touch, or lifelink. So this can come in the battlefield and be a menace, death toucher, a menace, lifelinker, a death touch, lifelinker. So you can pretty much choose based on your situation, or if like something else gives out death touch, you don't need to then have this thing have death touch. So I really like the flexibility here, and it's a three, three for three which means you're not losing value for this ability. I think that this is going to see play. Um, maybe not competitively, but it, like if you're running a mono black deck, like if that's still a thing, which I think it will be, um, I think that this will def th this might, well, this will see play in at least some of the versions of it. Next, we have Void Beckoner. This one also has some interestingness to it. It's an eight cost creature nightmare horror, death touch, and cycling. This, again, that's a mechanic and in the set. Um, and this is whenever you cycle it, put a death touch counter on target creature you control. So you can for three, just be like, oh, I don't have the mana to play this creature. I'm going to discard this card, which will give you a discard trigger for anything. You can draw a card, which will give you a draw your second card each turn trigger and a draw trigger, any of that. And you'll also get to put death touch, death touch on something permanently, which is pretty cool. Now, the Godzilla version of this card, now not all cards obviously have Godzilla versions, but some of them do, is Space Godzilla Death Corona, which... Um, the reason it's named that is because apparently his, like, mouth laser thing is called, like, Corona or something, the Corona Beam. Now, this was named back when that was not a bit, like, this was back before the coronavirus. Um, they have, on MTG Arena, it will be renamed to Space Godzilla, like, Space Villa, v Visitor, something like that, Space Invader, I think that's it. Um, so for the Ikoria that they've already printed, this will be an option, but then after that, they are not printing this card anymore. And on MTG Online, you will not be able to get this card. And you'll get the rest of the stuff from Treasure Chest, apparently. Whatever that means. I don't I don't play MTGO, but uh, just thought I'd let you guys know. Next, we have Zagoth Mamba. It's a one-cost creature, Nightmare Snake. Whenever this creature mutates, target creature and opponent control gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. I think this definitely goes in a mutate deck. Um, now, it does have to be this creature, which is kind of irritating, but you can just kind of throw this... Um, you, you, this has to be the base. You can't mutate this onto something, which I think severely limits it. But overall, this is going to be similar to that Chupacabra from um, the, the from the Explore mechanic, where it allows you to turn something into uh, removal, which can be very de deadly. Next, we have Dranus Stinger. It's a uh, two-cost creature human wizard. Whenever you cycle another card, it deals one damage to each opponent. So again, turning cycling into an actual win con, and then it has cycling itself. Pretty good. Necessary for limited. We have Cloud Piercer. It's a five-cost creature dinosaur. This has mutate, so it's actually cheaper to mutate it out. And it's a 5-4 with reach, and whenever this creature mutates, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. So this is the second card we've seen that has something like when you mutate, draw a card, discard a card, except this one says discard a card, draw a card. Um, so this can be either be mutated onto or mutated. Um, just note, like, um, just note, like, you, you, where you place things actually matters, and I'm not sure if when you mutate, you can rearrange things. We'll see. 
let's move on to the next card. Next, we have a Luca Co Copper Coat Outcast. So this is one of the new Planeswalkers. He's a five cost legendary Planeswalker Luca. He's a five loyalty. And he says, plus one, exile the top three cards of your library. Creature cards exiled this way gain. You may cast this as long as you control a Luca, which means if he ever gets another card, that it'll work there. Um, also, it doesn't have to be this instance. Uh, it's card draw for red, but it cares about creatures, which is something red doesn't do very often. Then we have a minus two, exile the Exile target creature you control, then reveal cards from your top of your library until you reveal a creature card with higher converted mana cost. Put that card on the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So, I mean, if you really wanted to run this, like, oh, you could run a bunch of one cost and him and then run, like, a 13 cost and boof, poof, it has to be a higher converted mana cost. So you could, like, run all three costs and then activate this ability and then when it, like, you run all but one and you run, like, a in historic, you run Galta or something and then just cheat that out, um, which is kind of interesting. And then minus seven, each creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. So you just want to have a lot of creatures on the field, which generally you will probably have because of him. So pretty good rounded Planeswalker. Um, not too super broken. Like, I, it's annoying, but I, I like, first off, his ultimate does nothing if he has no creatures, which means that you don't just have to take out him. You could just take out all the creatures, uh, which, I mean, he helps. And I think it's just overall really good. Next, we have Mosscoat Goriak. Um, it's a 3-cost 2-4 with Vigilance. That's it. Next, we have Fully Grown. It's a 3-cost instant. It says target creature gets plus 3, plus 3. Put a Trample counter on it. So instead of just getting Trample until end of turn, it's getting Trample on it forever. Now, honestly, this feels so natural for magic. I would not be surprised if trample counters and flying counters become a new norm for magic. Just being able to put these ability counters on them, uh, that seems highly likely. By the way, um, here are all the ability counters. Flying, First Strike, Death Touch, Hexproof, Lifelink, Menace, Reach, Trample, and Vigilance. And yes, you heard me right, Hexproof. I'm kind of worried for that one. Next, we have Bristling Boar. This one's a 4 cost 4 3, and it can't be blocked by more than one creature. This was reprinted in Corset 2020. Not much to say about it. More non humans. Next, we have Ty Titanith Rex. Uh, it's a 9 cost creature dinosaur beast with trample, but it also can cycle for 2, so if you don't have the 9 mana for the 11 11, you can just get rid of it. And then it says whenever you cycle it, put trample a uh, trample counter. So uh, this looks like a cycle where you're going to have really expensive cards that have an ability like Trample or Death Touch, and then you can put a counter of that type. Now looking at the other uh, counters, I'm going to assume white will do lifelink, um, red will probably do like first strike, and blue might do hexproof or flying, um, something like that. Either way, a decent card. Next, we have Gemis the Destroyer. This is translated, by the way, and this is the, um, like, the monster form, so the actual, like, card will be named something different, um, but it's a creature beast, and it says mutate one green green, and it says reach, cre reach trample whenever this creature mutates, destroy target artifact or enchantment opponent controls. If your opponent's playing artifacts, you can turn your mutating into that, too. So it looks like there's going to be a lot of cards that allow you to turn mutating into actual effects, which is what it needs to be able to actually be good. All right, next we have Vivian Monstrous Advocate, 5 cost, 3 lo loyalty, legendary planeswalker Vivian. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. You may cast creature spells from the top of your library. So you can basically just look at it at any time and just, if it's a creature spell, cast it. Then the plus one will create a 3 3 green beast creature token and put either Vigilance, Reach, or Trample on it. So basically, she gets to either create a Vigilance to uh, token, Reach token, or Trample token, which is very powerful in the fact that, oh, if your opponent's playing a bunch of flyers, do Reach. But you don't need reach if they're not using flyers and oh are they swinging back a lot oh okay let's do vigilance so we can swing and block oh are they um using a bunch of small creatures trample so it's very useful and then minus two when you cast your next creature spell this turn search your library for a creature card with lesser converted mana cost put it on the battlefield then shuffle your library so this is and again another vivian that really doesn't have a ultimate um we saw that in war of the spark we saw that in course at 2020 um but that shuffle will change the top card of your library, um, which is very interesting uh, for her top ability. So I actually really like this Planeswalker too. I might build a commander deck around her, or a brawl deck, sorry. Next we have Lutri the Spell Chaser. So this is the start of a cycle of companions. So I will, uh, so this is a three cost blue and red legendary creature, Elemental Otter. I love otters, but so it says companion. Each non-land card in your starting deck has a different name. 
If this card is your chosen com companion, you may cast it once from outside the game. So think about it like this. Say you're playing standard, and all of your cards, all of your non-lands have a different name. Then, if this guy is in your sideboard, you can cast him once per game. So think about it kind of like having him in your command zone. But you can only put him in your command zone if your deck follows the deck building rule. And so it's supposed to be like a deck building type of mechanic. Um, and this one is singleton based. Now, they did say they are banning this off the bat before it even comes out in Commander and Brawl. Because otherwise, this is just a free card for any red-blue deck that you could just throw in. For um, no cause. Also, I know there's no sideboard in Commander and Brawl, but they companions work. You can just have a companion, um, but not this one. And it has Flash, and it says when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control, you may choose new targets for the copy. Also, by the way, I don't know if they're actually banning it or if they're just banning it from being your companion, because you might be able to just throw this in your deck normally because it's not that broken, but we'll see. Um, overall, I really like this card. I, I like the idea of Companion. It's actually one of my favorite mechanics they've revealed in a very long time. Next we have Sprite Dragon. This one is a Fairy Dragon 1-1, one, one, red, blue, flying haste. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on Sprite Dragon. I really hope that's not a theme because non-creature spells are really broken right now. Um, and honestly, it doesn't seem like a theme they would do in a creature set, which is yeah, it's kind of a weird card. But then it's uh, like Godzilla form is Dorat the Perfect Pet, which you can see over there. Next we have Garuda, Doom of Depths, it's a 6 cost legendary creature, Demon Kraken, and it's co companion, um, like, thing, it's like, requirement is that your starting deck contains only cards with even converted mana cost. I'm going to assume in the non-showcase styles, or the non-stretched art cycle styles, it will say where zero, uh, where even is considered zero. Then it says, when Garuda enters the battlefield, each player puts the top four cards of their library into their graveyard, put a creature card with an even, even, with an even converted mana cost from among them onto the battlefield under your control. So, pretty good. And then it becomes Gigan Cyber Claw Terror. Then we have Karua the Macro Sage. It's a five cost legendary creature, dinosaur hippo. Its requirement is that you have no non land permanents with TMC3 or less, which really isn't going to have it in Commander because like things like Soul Ring and, uh, and a lot of ramp. And then it says whenever it enters the battlefield, draw a card for each other permanent you control with converted mana cost three or greater. Um, and also, it's not just, did I say non land permanents? It's just car spells can't be three or or two or less. Either way, um, it synergizes with itself if you're using its companion mode. If it's not and you want to just have a couple one or two costs, it's still probably pretty useful in a deck. Next we have Umori the Collector. This one's one of my favorites. It's uh, the Golgari version. It's a legendary creature ooze and it says each non-land card in your starting deck shares a card type. So I'm assuming it's like creature. So you say creature. All your cards have to be creatures. But then when it enters the battlefield, choose like creatures and then all your creatures cost one less. Now, it's a big ask to only have creatures, but if your deck is already doing it, this is just a free throw-in. Also, this does not count towards your 100 cards in, like, Commander. Next, we have Vadrock, Apex of Thunder. It's a blue, red, white, legendary creature, elemental, dinosaur, cat, flying first strike. Whenever this creature mutates, you may cast a target non-creature spell card with converted mana cost 3 or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. That's pretty crazy. If you find a consistent way to mutate, um, if you can, like, mutate, then unmutate, then mutate, and unmutate, you might be able to make some infinite combo with this. And then he becomes Rodin, Titan of Winged Fury. Um, yeah. And its mutate cost actually is more than his regular cost, which is different. Then we've Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Now, you might notice this one doesn't have a normal card, and it does. It says it does. It's Zythora, Strength Incarnate. This is the buy a box promo, so the only way to get... Godzilla, I believe. So, Zil Zilortha is probably going to be in the actual set. So, this time the buy box promo is purely cosmetic, uh, which I think is probably actually a good thing. But it's a uh, two color, so it's uh, red, green, uh, and it's kind of like the inverted of a like Arcane Arc Arcades Arcades or like High Alert, where instead of power being equal to toughness, this makes basically toughness equal to power, um, which is very cool, but only when they take damage, so it's not like if they have zero power, they just die. Um, so you'd want to play this with, like, a bunch of, like, three ones or, like, six ones, you know, cards that have really high tough power and low toughness. Now, he himself is a 7-3, which basically means he's a 7-7. Seven, seven. However, um, like, spells that do minus three, minus three, for instance, will still kill.
Overall, I actually really like the card design, but not the Godzilla part. Either way, we have Snapdax, Apex of the Hunt. It's a red, white, black, legendary creature, dinosaur, cat, nightmare. With mutate and double strike, and whenever it mutates, it deals 4 damage to target creature, planeswalker, and opponent controls, and you gain 4 life. That's utterly insane. If you can find a consistent way to mutate, you can just keep removing things. Again, turning mutate into other things is important, so I think mutate could have a serious chance of doing well. And then he's King Caesar Awoken Titan as well. Then we have Eluna, Apex of Wishes. Also, by the way, all of the mutate creatures also have showcase styles. So, like, if you want to use these as your commander, you're going to have lots of options. You have, like, foil, you have showcase, you have foil showcase, and you have the whole um, Godzilla style. Here we have Mutate, uh, Flying Trample, whenever this creature mutates, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land permanent card. Put that card in the battlefield or into your hand. So if you don't want to put it into on the battlefield, you can put it in your hand. That's pretty crazy. I mean, you'd probably want to play this in a deck with lots of really expensive stuff. I mean, you could throw this in like a Jota-esque deck. Um, yeah. Also, by the way, Mutate does not dodge commander tax because you are casting it. And then he becomes Ghidorah, King of the Cosmos. Next, we have Brokos, Apex of Forever. It's a black, green, blue, legendary creature, Nightmare Beast Elemental with Mutate and Trample, and whenever you ca you may, like, mutate him from the graveyard, so you can just keep bringing him back. And he's also Biocourt Space Godzilla, which is a really weird name. Then we, that we loop back. So, that's gonna do it for this video. Now, I'm, I'm very disappointed with the Godzilla thing. I really wish they didn't do it. It sounds like they put a lot of work into this, and honestly, I think most of the player base is not liking it, but whatever. Overall, besides that, Ikoria, I'm actually really excited for. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's just not that exciting, um, but I think this is going to be pretty epic. I know it's being delayed, which kind of sucks, but um, I think it's pretty awesome. Let me know what you think of all these spoilers down below. I know it's been a long video, but there was a lot of spoilers, and I had to explain mechanics and all that. Um, so that's going to do it for this video. Hit that like button, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.